king of pop, everyone knows who Michael Jackson is. His life has been the subject of controversy and scandal for decades, and the famed Finding Neverland documentary brought about new interest in his legacy. But what some of you may not know is that Michael Jackson is largely responsible for the popularization of the Super Bowl halftime show. Before he took the stage in 1993, the halftime show was mostly an afterthought, with college marching bands or fading Showtime acts performing. But when Jackson took the stage, inarguably the biggest celebrity at the time, 130. 33 million people tuned in, and to this day, it remains the most watched halftime show ever. Today, we're talking about cultural icon Michael Jackson and his Super Bowl halftime show. Tomorrow, though, you decide. Let us know in the comments down below who you'd like to see on the next episode of Where Are They Now? And please don't forget to like this video for more content just like it. Michael Joseph Jackson was born in Indiana to a working class family. He and his nine other siblings lived in a two bedroom home. He and his siblings formed a band called the Jackson Brothers, later renamed to the Jackson 5 when Michael was only 6 years old. His father was a harsh man and routinely harmed Michael physically and emotionally. Eventually, the family began touring and they permanently relocated to Los Angeles. They garnered a good amount of success, enough that they were considered, quote, a cutting edge example of black crossover artists. Crossover artists means they appealed to both black and white audiences, a rarity at the time. Eventually, as the siblings got older, they moved on to solo careers and Michael moved to New York. He garnered massive success and when Thriller came out in 1980, it was the best selling album in the world and remains so today. There were many controversies that Jackson was involved in throughout his decades of being one of the most celebrated artists ever. In the mid to late 80s, people started to notice that Michael's skin was getting much lighter and tabloids accused him of bleaching his skin. But his dermatologist had diagnosed him with vitiligo and lupus, which are both skin conditions. The vitiligo was a large contributor to the lightened skin as it's a melanin condition where patches of the skin grow lighter and it is likely that Michael had used bleaching makeup to even out his skin tone. You can't control vitiligo and it can spread throughout the whole body sometimes. With the light makeup that Michael applied, his skin could appear very pale. The singer always said he never purposely bleached his skin. Quote, When people make up stories that I don't know who I am, it hurts me. Despite stating multiple times that he doesn't bleach his skin, the media ran with it, and to this day, people still believe that he intentionally tried to make himself appear white. It didn't help that Michael did lie about the cosmetic surgeries he's had. Although he admitted to having two nose jobs and a cleft chin surgery, Michael Jackson's mother admitted that she feared he had become addicted to getting plastic surgery on top of his habits of dropping massive amounts of weight in unhealthy manners. That being said, the singer was always eccentric. He had a pet monkey named Bubbles that he would take with him on tour. He once brought a llama into the studio while writing a duet with Queen, and that ended up souring the relationship. In 1987, the Rolling Stone described Jackson as, quote, the flighty genius star child, a celebrity virtually all of his life who dwells in the fairy tale kingdom of fellow celebrities, animals, mannequins, and cartoons, who provides endless fodder for the tabloids. But it's the same child in Michael who inspires the artistry that fuels all the subsidiary industries, who turns his primal fears and fantasies into wondrous, hyperkinetic, and emotional music. Maybe it's due to the harm he experienced as a or because fame and attention is all he's ever known, but it doesn't really matter because the outcome was the same. And Michael's fixation on the maintenance of a childlike personality well into his 30s and 40s led to him being accused in 1993 and again later in the 2000s of the charges that he is now known for. His own sister, Latoya, accused him of it as well, although she did later retract the statement. The charges, whether true or false, were dropped with the settlement outside of court for $23 million. If they aren't true, then Jackson's claims that he is a of a father wanting to extort money from the close relationship his son had with the singer were true. But even if that may be, I can't really see any reason why someone in their middle age would even have a close relationship with a child that isn't their kin. All of these allegations occurred in 1993, a few months after Michael's Super Bowl halftime show. Pivoting towards a much lighter topic, we are going to discuss how the halftime show performance he did was the beginning of the performances we now know today. The theatrics we see and will see this year with Eminem, Mary J. Blige, Snoop Dogg, and Dr. Dre are all owed to Michael Jackson's Super Bowl halftime show performance that sparked the frenzy around the event. Prior to Jackson's performance, the halftime show was regarded as a last minute filler space. It allowed the teams to recover some stamina from the first two quarters of the game and was just meant to keep the crowd's attention while they waited for the third quarter to begin. Typically, marching bands or older past celebrities would play a few songs and it generally wasn't very exciting. Without Michael Jackson's performance, it's very likely that the halftime show would now just be a space for commercials. And 
people would probably switch to the other channel while they wait for the football game to continue. It certainly wouldn't be the event that sometimes garners more viewers than the game itself. To fully understand how Michael Jackson changed the game, we need to look at the 1992 Super Bowl, which occurred a year prior. The halftime performers were a marching band playing an ode to the Winter Olympics, and it was really boring to say the least. It was so boring, in fact, that Fox decided to air an episode of a comedy sketch show at the same time as the halftime show in an attempt to lure the audience away from the game and to their network. And it totally worked. People switched to the comedy show, and a lot of the people didn't even finish watching the football game. Well, the network airing the Super Bowl was really upset, and the idea was born to turn the halftime show into a pop music spectacle. Now, interestingly, the NFL has a policy wherein they don't pay their performers to appear in the event, a policy that remains in place today. Because of that, it was very difficult for the management to even get Michael to perform. He only agreed to do so when Frito-Lay, the chip company, and the NFL agreed to donate $100,000 to Jackson's charity and give him commercial space to air a charity promotion instead. When Michael performed, it did exactly what the network hoped it would do, and ratings actually increased during his performance. The event was so massive. It featured the singer appearing on top of two jumbotrons before he catapulted onto center stage. He then stands still and silent for two minutes two whole minutes before giving the performance that credited him with causing the largest television tune-in in the United States. He did his famous moonwalk, combined his most beloved music, and ended his performance with a choir of 3,500 Los Angeles area children singing his song, We Are the World. Every Super Bowl halftime show performer since then owes their publicity to Michael, who popularized and created the fanfare that we know to be around the event today. Every single halftime show since then has been compared to Michael's monumental performance. Despite it being the first of a long list of massive performer appearances since then, many still regard it as the best. Even this year, for the 2022 halftime show, wherein we are set to watch some of the biggest rap and hip hop performers take the stage, don't be surprised if you see it being compared to Michael's. The man may have had plenty of personal controversies and trials, but he is one of the greatest performers of all time. Who else can stand completely still, in total silence, for two uninterrupted minutes, and still have the crowd going absolutely ballistic? He is the man who bridged a lot of the gap between black and white audiences during a time when it was certainly much more controversial to do so. To this day, the halftime show is one of the most watched events every year, and it's commonplace for many non-football fans to tune in just to watch the event. And that's all thanks to the king of pop and his worldwide influence. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Where Are They Now? Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more videos just like it. I've been your host, Sierra. See you next time.